Good morning. Um, I'm aware a little bit, at least a little bit, of the dangers of self-indulgence and how they easily accompany something like this, any speaking really, and uh, particularly to something like this, making a video, my goodness, like yeah, I have something to say and anybody should hear it. Nevertheless, as Paul said, having the spirit of having the spirit of faith, we speak. I'm not trying to justify myself in terms of what Paul knew, did, and understood, but I believe that the spirit of faith causes us to speak. And uh, though it may be fraught with many dangers, speaking, we can speak of ourselves. We can speak of things that are of no value to anyone. Nevertheless, by the grace of God, I'm being more convinced of this every day. It is only those who are of faith that can really have any right or do have any right, <clears throat> if it can be put in those terms, to speak. The man without faith, the man without any foundation established as to truth and reality, or is unable to or unwilling to, by the and if one is willing, it is only by the grace of God, to take a stand that some things are real and true and eternal and beyond the vicissitudes, not the vicissitudes, but the um, caprice of random and chaotic events. So it is only really the man who has got the spirit of faith, rightly or wrongly, has any so-called, if I can say it again, right to speak. He believes some things are true. He believes some things are not. But if we swim in the waters where anything that we decide is true is true, anything we decide is false is false, what right is there to impart? None. None. Because we're not speaking from a place, and we can't be speaking... If we're speaking from that place, we know we can't be speaking to a place of truth. But if we have any hope that we are somehow, by the grace of God, been established in any truth at all, then we know truth is real and relatable. Because first, we have, by the grace of God, related to God, found his reality, truth, found his truth, reality, and therefore we can communicate with one another in that hope that the exchange will be mutual, that there will be a connection, communication, that real communication is possible. Very wordy perhaps self-indulgent, this last speaking, God knows, but necessary, I feel, because I am not unaware. God knows I am not unaware of my tendency toward self-indulgence, my tendency to think mostly of myself, and only by grace is it on those occasions that I am reminded to be reminded of God. And so a brother posted this this morning and it hit me right in the heart and I understood with my understanding and you may not have it, you may never come to it, it may mean nothing to you, God knows. God knows. I know I have been somewhat either presumptuous or overconfident or just confident that in some things I have said believers will come to some, some understanding of certain matters because there are things that when we discover them, as Paul discovered them, we find out, wow, I'm not, first of all, I'm not the only one <clears throat> to have discovered this. And Paul may in some sense, and the other brothers, not with with uh, notwithstanding, you know, not excluding the other brothers, Peter, 
James, John, all who have written in the scriptures, that their coming to this <clears throat> was not of themselves, not a private interpretation, even though all revelation is intensely personal. All revelation, have you not found that out, is intensely personal. And if there is an issue, the issue then becomes how to make what is the intensely personable, personal and received intensely personally that which is suitable, beneficial, healthful, not harmful to the body. And so it is in that learning that we learn. Not everything we say is necessary. Many things we say may be unnecessary. And again, saying that, if this is unnecessary to you and may never be necessary to you, I can say that. But this brother posted something this morning that so hit me in the heart in understanding, rightly or wrongly, making no claim other than I'm excited to see it. I'm provoked in seeing it. I hear it. I think I understand it. And in that place where revelation comes so intensely personally, I'm again reminded God understands me. God knows me. God knows what I am as a man. God has seen not only seen, but created what he knows and has always known. <clears throat> so before I get carried away in emotion, I'd like to read it. It's a very brief uh, section of Job, and I know, I believe, we have probably, maybe all, if not all, most, at least many, able to repeat a certain section of it. For it's in that section that says, I know that my Redeemer lives. But um, it starts in Job 19, verse 23. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. That they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. That this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. But it is those first few words that really opened to me and for me as a man that I was being communicated with. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. That they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. I've made videos, so what? I've spoken, so what? Spoken in such a form that some might call it preaching, so what? I've written, so what? So what? And lately God has kept me in this place at the wonder of what Paul saw because it remains wonderful and it remains quite a reversal of common thought. And I can say that because to me it is my common thought. And I do not doubt anymore as a man that it is most common thought. But it is a reversal of that. And if any of you have been in communication with me or cared to see where I'm at recently. Not, not that you should have any care, but if you just know, it is in that verse, the law came in that the transgression might increase. What a tremendous bordering on at first hearing 
absurd thing to say. And see, to say it, and then to question, how does one see that? That this makes sense. This thing, the law, <clears throat> given of God to man, and that man has, as I have, assumed, was both doable and given to make man better, so to speak. I will be better if I do these things. And then Paul sees the law came in that the transgression might increase. It is none of the things I assumed. None of the things I believe so many assume. The law came in so God would help us to do right and be better and all of these things. No. God knew we were incapable. God knew we were dead in sins and trespasses. God knew that in the day we ate of it, we died. But we didn't know we were dead. We didn't really believe we were dead. We believed we still had a shot at being good. And God knows this. God sees this. God understands this thing operating in a dead thing that is telling it it can still grasp, it can still reach, it can still make a successful attempt to be that which good is, which is God. How does God convince the dead they are dead? <laughs> by giving them a good thing that in them and by the perversity of the flesh produces nothing but sin. The law is holy, righteous, and good. It is a good thing. However, when the man wakes up to even that which is good by my perversity works evil in me, how lost am I? How lost am I? I've said this before, or at least written, maybe even in videos. It's like a tumor. Milk is good. Fish is good. All these things are good to eat. But if one has a tumor, it also nourishes the tumor. So these good things now become the source for nutrition to that tumor that kills the host. And that's, obviously, if you take that analogy, sin working in us. But the thing is, we're not on our way to death. We are dead in it. Dead in trespasses and sins. Dead in offenses. This thing has already done its work. And so much so that when a good thing comes, it can produce nothing of us or in us that is good, but we see only sin, even in our attempt to keep, to do. Sin is provoked. Sin is provoked. Now that in itself, as Paul saw, is such a strange <laughs> and a terrible thing. <clears throat> when one's the first one to see it and believe it, and then have the boldness to say it. Say it to, to and among those who had held the law up. This is what makes us good. This is what makes us special. This is what makes us particularly and peculiarly wonderful to God. Yet what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? Did not Moses gives you, give you the law? But none of you keep it. None of you keep it. You're taking your stand on something. Oh, Moses, yeah, Moses gave us the law. Yeah, that's, so what? You don't keep it. Jesus saw the charade. Jesus saw the masquerade. Jesus saw the fraud. And he wasn't afraid to get right in their face and say it. And why do you go about to kill me is his next line. Because he understood 
what that was going to do, what everything, everything he had been given to say was appointed to lead him to one place. And provoking, 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 provoking. And then taking all of that that was provoked upon himself and bearing it to death, that it would die, be done away with. And we even find in the New Testament where the brothers meet and they pray and, you know, what should we, what are we to keep of the law? Are we to keep anything of the law, you know? And it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, but, you know, they say in that section that, look, this was a burden, not only for us, but for our fathers. I believe it says something like that. So they're coming clean. This thing that we once took to ourselves as setting us apart, making us very special, let's just admit it. It was killing us. It was a burden. Far cry from, well, far cry from being false, as the Pharisees may have been, or as the, some of the Pharisees, surely. We know some Pharisees believed. Saul, <laughs> Joseph of Arimathea if I pronounce that correctly. <clears throat> but um, to come to that, ordinances, rules, regulations, they don't work. They don't work. And so again, coming to this, oh, that my words were written, oh, that they were inscribed in a book. That were they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. There's a place, and he's about to say it. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at the last day on the earth. That those words that he was so convicted of, so that were so real to him, he wanted them engraved, written, unchangeable. And why? And why? And if you've been through it, you understand it. If you haven't been through it, I'm not going to in any way say you need to or have to go through it or prophesy one will go through it, but you may. And when you do, may you find some comfort in knowing you are not the first one to touch that plot of earth. We all like excursions and adventures, and it's wonderful. And sometimes we look for where none has ever gone. And Paul certainly found some of those places. I'm not saying he was provoked to go where none have gone, that that was his motive, but in seeking the Lord, the Lord took him places where none had been. As with Peter, John, James, as with all the faithful who have written here in the Scriptures. But to find, when you stand there, I'm seen, I'm known, I'm understood. And this shows me I have been understood because in my speaking, in my writing, in my doing, in my life, I have known the place where I want to lay hold of something unchangeable, something or seen something unchangeable. But I know, I know when tribulations come, when the changes and vicissitudes of this life are thrust upon me, how changeable I am. But in that moment, I know the truth, and I want the truth written, persistent, consistent, so that even if I change, this remains. Even if I'm moved by circumstance, this remains. Even if things break me to where I deny this thing, this remains as true. And Paul knew that. Paul knew that. And I'm not making anything of Paul, nor even of Job or any man, but that God knows us. God knows this desire we have to be secure and true and consistent 
And yet he also knows how frail we are and subject to being blown to and fro by either every wind or doc, uh, wind, or, wind of doctrine or circumstance. And how do I know Paul knew this? How do I know? How might you know? He says it. He says it. To those to whom he had presented the true gospel of God, he says, if we or an angel of heaven preach to you any other gospel than that which you have see, received, may he be accursed. May he be accursed. Paul was fixing this as best he could, as most he could as firmly as he could, understanding that it could be him if we, it could be him who could be changed by something, but he would not relent. This thing I deliver is true and real, and no matter what else at any time may come against it, it stands. <laughs> And if it be me that comes against it in hypocrisy, if it be me that be found a liar, it doesn't matter. It is true, unbreakable, eternal, and of God. And I realize I can be seen as very self-indulgent because this has provoked me so. And I am just letting off the reality it's touched in me. And I have known as a man, I have known those places where I've either been foolish, been terrible, been rotten, been mean, been vile, venal. And it has cost me something, and it has broken me, and I have come to that place of that I would look at now as a sort of repentance and want to stay there. Why do I do these things? I will not do them anymore. I don't want to do them anymore. God, help me. Stick me in this place where I will not lose sight of the cost of being those things, where I will not lose sight of how terrible and wretched I am, or I will not lose sight of how my end, my disposition is such that I could do that. Keep me here where I'm broken. Keep me here where I see. Keep me here where I will not return to those forms of things. And yet I returned. There was nothing I could do. Because in that, that time, and in those places, my confidence in the Lord, though he knew me, was as nothing. I was, I was deeply, deeply doing my own thing. And as much as I may have wanted to stay in that place, even as much as Job said, he wanted to stay in that place. Let my words be written in iron, with a pen of iron and lead in rock. Let this stand. I know that my Redeemer lives, and I, I shall see him in the last day on the earth. Oh, praise God. Praise God. And I wrought much misery and woe to those who were around me for not being able, because I could not of myself, stay in that place of brokenness. Stay in that place of soberness. Stay in that place of light where I saw my weakness, my frailty, understood things come against me and change me. And now I, though I didn't want it to happen, there was no confidence in God as my sole and sovereign protector. But things have changed. 
by the grace of God. We cannot keep ourselves, brothers and sisters. We may like to think we can. We may try to keep ourselves. And there is nothing wrong with those practices and instructions. God forbid I speak against any. Even such as might be rules to us, to help us. But it is to the end of seeing Christ as the Savior and the Lord, who alone of his good pleasure is keeping what is his. And therefore to him be all the glory. We cannot keep ourselves in that spot. We don't want to keep ourselves in that spot. We want to wander again and see what else might be out there. And if in that tribulation comes, if in that circumstance turns, that we are now found broken, God forbid. God forbid we submit to that. But even if so, even if so, that when God gives us word to speak that we know is true and real, may we, by his grace, find that in that place of all striving to stick it, he is the one whose word is established forever in heaven. Thy word, O God, and his word is Jesus the Lord, his Christ our King. And He is immovable and unshakable. And everything that can be shaken will be shaken, even in us, till only that which is unshakable remains. May the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed.